Welcome to this introduction to Agile Animations. Watching something move is a lot more intuitive and pleasurable than reading or listening to a description of a process. I think we're all visual learners. And personally, I think animations are a great way to show people how things work. According to the Visual Teaching Alliance, and with a name like that, I'm sure they don't have a bias, 90% of information transmitted to the brain is visual. We process images 60,000 times faster than text. 40% of our brain's nerve fibers are linked to the retina and visual information is 83% more effective for learning and especially for retention. We can use animations to show concepts such as inserting new changes into a backlog or how items can be reprioritized in the backlog. Here's a little animation that shows cards or user stories flowing across a Kanban board. We can see that every week um, a couple more, two or three items are progressed from the backlog into ready for development, then in development, next into testing, and finally done. So why animations for Agile? Well. Many of today's complex projects involve solving problems and building things that we haven't done for our organizations before. This falls into the category of knowledge work. It manipulates ideas and data, not concrete and steel. And because of this, our work is often invisible and intangible and transient. The invisible means obviously we can't see it. It's ideas or software or designs. We can't touch it either, and because of that, we likely experience issues and problems differently than our peers do. And it's transient, meaning it doesn't persist. Today's problems are not like yesterday's problems. We don't really have a good track record for how we solve yesterday's problems either. And so applying them to today's issues is a problem. Creating animations takes a lot of time, but I think it's worth it because they can help address these issues. They provide clarity around ideas. Now we can visualize the invisible. They show interactivity between components so we can confirm our understandings with others or highlight conflicts and gaps in our knowledge. And finally, they create a permanent model of these aha moments, so they're persistent. Here's another animation showing dependencies between teams. We can see each of the teams has a backlog of work the red team, though, has some items that the blue team will need to do for them. And likewise, the blue team has some items from the green team as well as the red team. I guess if you're colorblind, this isn't going to make a lot of sense. But here we go. The project's getting started and we can see stories moving across the board. That blue story three with the red team has to be moved down to the blue team's backlog. Unfortunately, when teams receive work from other teams, they quite often don't think of them as high priority. Obviously, they've got their own work to do. And so when another team comes to them, it quite often gets put at the bottom of their backlog. And then we have to work with that team, explain its priority, get it escalated up the backlog. Uh, and so it gets worked on. So typically, items get passed to another team. They already have work to do. Um, at best, they'll pick them up next sprint or iteration. And so it creates a little bit of a delay. Um, you'll also see here some multicolored cards, which are placeholders for work. And finally, the work gets done, but it takes longer. And so here, the project duration is likely to be the number of teams multiplied by their average sprint length multiply by one and a half. And the one and a half is for, we don't always get items worked on in the next iteration. Let's say half of them go over into the following uh, iteration or sprint. And so here we got three teams. If one of the teams was on a cadence of three weeks, then our average um, sprint length would be 2.7, multiplied by that 1.5. And it's showing us how, while each of these projects should have finished perhaps in seven weeks in isolation, when we have dependencies between them, we start introducing delays. Now, three teams working together isn't really that much of a problem. Quite often, we have many more dependent teams. Here's a quick snapshot of a common company situation where we have a combination of vendors, project teams, maybe a microservices team, an environments team that spin up cloud environments for us, let's say, 
And we also have an operations team who we hand over work to to do sustainment or ongoing um, support issues. And here we see that you know items from one vendor is blocked or waiting for work or feedback from other teams. And of course, it's not just the vendor, the project team also have their own issues and dependencies. And if we were to map it out, it becomes this big nasty web of dependencies and handoffs. And this is what a lot of companies struggle with is that they're overly dependent. And the animations I was using for this presentation were to show these issues and problems and then start introducing some patterns and solutions. So here we're seeing a Kanban board and we start marking our blocked issues or where we have dependencies. And so maybe at stand up every day, team members say, yep, yeah, you know, I would like to work on this, but it's blocked by this group. And here they're putting a tick every day that they discuss that. So we're getting a little bit of a not only blocked items, but also duration of blocked items. And that's as we zoom in, that's what this little uh, tick is showing. Another approach would be to separately call out which of our work items have dependencies. And so here we see a, a swim lane on our Kanban board showing which items have dependencies and which don't. But anyway, I'm getting carried away with solving dependency problems here. This is a video about how do we create these animations. So here we are finally in PowerPoint learning how to do these animations. The traditional way to do this would be with the animations and then move lines or move paths option. So you would select the object, then select the animation you want to apply, such as a custom path. Draw the path you would like the object to move through. And then in the preview mode, it would show you that path. And then if you wanted to animate it one more time, move it somewhere further, you would go over, add an animation to it, and then add another custom path, which would then allow you to move it, say, to the next column. Once again, it will show you that. But now we've got to kind of remember all of where these things are at, and it soon gets complicated very quickly. So. In this example, I've just got five cards moving through five different lanes, and we've already got a lot of animation that happening. If I have a look at the animation pane, we can see a lot of different objects here. And really, this is the, the old school way of doing it. This is kind of the waterfall way of doing it. And if you don't believe me, look, there's even a little Gantt chart hidden away in the animation pane there. There's an easier way to do animation, uh, and it's especially better when you've got lots and lots of steps or lots of objects. The way to do it is using morph transformations. So here we've got a sample backlog, and what we'll do is go up to transitions, and we're gonna use this morph transformation. And to do that, the easiest way is to just duplicate the slide, then make the changes you want for your first animation step. Go up to your morph transition speed. I'll move it down to one second and I'll change it from um, on mouse click to start straight away. Now apply the morph transition and we can see how that would look. From here, it's just a case of continuing the process. So duplicate the slide, that copies the morph transition Make the changes you want to occur. Check it with the preview. And then on to the next step. This is much faster than the previous attempt of tracking all the different moving objects and sorting through the animations. Using this approach, we can quickly build smooth animations for our Agile projects. The downside is it creates lots of slides, but I think that's okay. Slides are free and these vector graphics are very small. So it's not like file sizes will become an issue. What if you have slide numbers, you ask? Well, why the heck do you have slide numbers? Why does anyone need to know if this is slide four rather than slide five? However, if you really need slide numbers, I guess you could create fake slide numbers with the same number for each step through the animations 
and then progressive ones afterwards. Let's play those slides we just created. Pretty slick, hey? You get fast at the duplicate move process, but it is still work. If lazy people want to steal your slides without giving proper credit, you could send them a deck with the Morphing Transition slides cut out. Or better still, save the animation as a GIF image and include it on a single slide. This actually works pretty well, it's quite an elegant solution. They play well in presentation mode and it keeps your slide numbers working correctly and the decks are short. However, you can't pause it or interact with it. This next slide is actually just a single slide showing the animation we looked at before. Um, and I actually speeded up the, the GIF animation. One of the side effects we didn't talk about before was the fact that items traveling a long way appear to go faster than items traveling short distances. And that's because the whole transition happens within the one second or half a second period that was specified. With an animated GIF in your deck, people won't be able to edit the effects either, which may or may not be a good thing. Some muggles might be freaked out about moving pictures in their PowerPoint designer mode also. Anyways, so far we've used the morph transition effect for just moving objects, but you can also resize them too. In my Agile 2018 presentation on reducing team dependencies, I talked about the transition from using projects to accomplish work to instead adopting more of a product-based view of work. Here we see the different groups that were used at one of my clients. We had sponsors, a number of vendors, a whole bunch of different project teams. This is a simplification. There are over 20 project teams, supporting teams, and then a maintenance or sustainment group. The path to a product transition included splitting out supporting teams so that they could go work with their respective project teams. We merged several teams, moved our ops and environments people into project teams where they served that team. We next asked the vendors to work on site. So the bulk of their staff were on site with the teams. And then we did the same with the business folks who were previously at a different location in the same town and the sustainment groups too. In the end, we actually had product teams, not project teams. This was an example, but it allowed us to add more and more products. So animations can show not only work movement, but anything you like, such as organizational transformations, budget changes, etc. Modern projects are complex and uncertain, Work and issues are typically invisible, intangible, and transient. So animations are useful to help align people. They're visual and interactive. You can point at them and tell me where I have it all backwards. They're persistent too. You can save them and send them to other people. Thanks for sticking through this long-winded walkthrough. Hopefully you can see why animations are especially useful in environments where work is abstract and new. If you have any questions or comments, please get in touch. I would also love to see any graphics or animations that you've built and find useful, so please share them with me. Remember, we're all visual learners, so have some fun with it and we'll be more effective. Thanks for watching. Bye.